I'm sure all of you remember uh, what it was like at school, at least here in Ireland, uh, on winter days when people would come in first thing in the morning or maybe after lunch break, uh, everyone would kind of crowd around the radiators and the, the, like the, 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 the top drawer spot was to sit on the radiator. You know, and obviously there's a limited number of spaces and people would crowd in. And maybe in primary school, I remember when different things were handed out, uh, different, you know, music folders or whatever, there was always one that was a little better than the others, you know, and, uh, oh, I want the blue one, I want the blue one, you know, whatever it was, you know. Or there were certain seats that were closer to the radiator and further away from the door, further away from the window, so it was warmer, uh, or whatever it may be. And in all of these situations, same in, in our community here, like there may be certain seats that are more comfortable than others, or who gets the comfy blankets and all of that kind of rubbish. And, uh, yeah, so, point being, uh, in our daily lives, right from our youth, okay, uh, it's kind of almost instinctual in us to kind of, to look for comfort and to look for the best, to look for the path of least resistance. So to go, to do, to do the thing that's easy, to go to the place where it's comfortable, to, to just, you know, find a place where we can just be at, at, at ease in ourselves. Uh, it's, it's, as I say, it's instinctual in, in, in most of us. We just, we just naturally look for it. You know, if you go to a, a room, you'll generally kind of gravitate towards the warm spot. You go over to the stove, you know. Who stands, who stands in the breezy spot, like? So it's kind of instinctual in us. Okay. Uh, hold on to the thought for a sec. Today's, the readings for the last while, the last week and a bit, uh, have been from the letter to the Hebrews, right? And this, this speaks to us a lot about priesthood. Uh, so we've heard about Melchizedek for a couple of days, so you are a priest forever, a priest like Melchizedek of old. This man whose descent isn't known, we don't know who his parents are, so it's kind of a mystical, he's kind of a mystical character, really. Uh, normally, when a, a king would arrive, or someone would arrive, you'd speak about his lineage and his forefathers and what they did and where they came from. Melchizedek, we don't know anything. He just kind of peers out of nowhere. But he does something... He enacts a liturgy, if you will, which it's just when, when you see all the bits put together, like it's just God's mind is just astounding, like how, how he just plans all of these things and then they are recorded in scripture and then we can read about them 2,000 years later. But after a successful battle, Abraham comes back with his people, the soldiers, and he meets Melchizedek. And Melchizedek performs, it's, it's, not, it's not mass. But to our eyes, it sounds very much like Mass. He offers bread and wine. So you can imagine the, the, an altar is set out, and bread and wine are offered and then shared. Right? Like it's just the re, such a clear prefiguration of what we now call Mass, of the Passover, which will happen a couple of centuries later. If we rewind a bit to almost the beginning of, of, of Scripture, when Abel, so Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel. Abel uh, offers the, the, the first fruits, if you will, of, of, of his flock. So he offers a lamb, and this, this lamb is sacrificed, and there's blood shed. And this pleases God more than Cain's sacrifice, which was grain. Okay? Uh, you think of Abraham then, then being asked to sacrifice his son. He doesn't have to go through it, thank God. Uh, but he's sacrificing his son. And then again, up to, up to Melchizedek, who offers, sacrifices these, uh, these gifts, bread and wine. In our gospel today, we see that there were problems back then in the priesthood. Right? There were problems with how the priests of the day, the Pharisees, how they saw Jesus, how they understood the law, or how they didn't understand the law how they understood their own priesthood or how they didn't understand their own priesthood, how when the bar was raised and something was revealed. Now, admittedly, Jesus' actions were, were, were different, were somewhat unpredictable. Talking about himself as God when they believe there's only one God, or how can you be God and there only be one God? Because how does this work? But rather than ask and try and deepen their understanding, they try to kill him. They see him working, working, on a, on a Sunday, which is against the law, well, I'm sorry, on the Sabbath day, uh, which is against the law, but rather than like, ask for clarification, well, to be honest, he clarifies it. Is it against the law to do good on, on the Sabbath day? Well, no. I'm going to heal this man. If 
you had a donkey, would you not bring it to get a drink of water on the Sabbath day? And could I not untether this man from his illness? You know, so they had, they had the law, but they completely misunderstood it. Like, Fast forward now to our day. Sorry, no, that, this is, I hope you can keep up uh, with all of these thoughts today. Fast forward now to our day, where we have a priesthood as well. And our, the priesthood that we live today, this didn't come about in the Second Vatican Council, nor did it come about in the last century. The, priesthood, the way we live our priesthood today, this goes the whole way back, right? To Abel, sacrificing a lamb. Abraham, being asked to sacrifice his son. Melchizedek, offering bread and wine. You'll notice that's the only sacrifice so far that doesn't have blood involved. Again, it's a prefiguration. You're putting these things together. Passover, where the blood of the lamb, the lamb is sacrificed. The blood of the lamb is painted over the doorpost. The angel of death passes over, and those in these households where the blood is there are saved by the blood of the lamb. The firstborn in those, houses, those households is not killed. You fast forward to Jesus dying on the cross, the last supper. Behold the lamb of God. This is my body. Do this in memory of me. So they start doing it in memory of him, which we call the Holy Mass. So the priesthood, the Eucharist, are just there. They're so bound together and always have been. Always have been. So when people talk about priesthood and their different ideas of priesthood today and what needs to change, what should change, like, I mean, do they have any idea what they're really talking about? Like, look back into, like, scripture. It's, it's, it's so deeply rooted what the priest is called to be and how Jesus set up the priesthood and how from all time uh, this, this offering of sacrifice is key to understanding the priesthood. In today's understanding, often uh, priesthood is just seen as it's, it's, uh, it's a form of governance of the church. There you go. It's just governance. They, they're the ones who call the shots. They're the ones who will decide how many collections we'll have on Sunday and who's going to be an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist. My goodness, like, what rubbish. Like, the heart of priesthood is sacrifice. The heart of priesthood is sacrifice. Always has been. When I was a seminarian, I mentioned this book earlier this week. Just this, this is my go-to book for the priesthood. Fulton Sheen, Priest is Not His Own. Um, but I, I read this before my ordination, and I loved it. There was one particular uh, quotation. I, I've, read, re, I've read from this already this week, but there was one particular quotation which I read uh, during my uh, retreat before my diaconate. And it's really, really stuck, stuck with me. It's, uh, it's not that long. It's about a page. Hold on, though. It's good. I promise. So, okay, so we're talking about Peter. It's so easy for us to be ready, like Peter at Caesarea Philippi, to confess the divine Christ, but far from ready to accept the suffering Christ. It was the same Peter who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then when Jesus speaks about going to Jerusalem and there he will die, Peter draws Jesus to his side and began to remonstrate with him. Never, he said, never, Lord, shall such a thing befall you. Because of this, the Lord called him Satan. For it was Satan who at the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus tempted him to reject the way of suffering. Remember, tell these stones to turn into loaves of bread. Throw yourself from the top of this high building. Don't worry, you know, you don't have to do anything. God will do everything. Just you don't, God will take care of you. Put him to the test if you wish. Or then ultimately, I will give you all of these nations of the world just bow down to me. It's easier. You'll be rich, comfortable. You can govern it all. Just bow down before me. All rejecting the way of suffering. Because of this, the Lord called him Satan. For it was Satan who at the beginning of the public ministry tempted him to reject the way of suffering by offering him three shortcuts to his kingdom without the cross. The denial of his victimhood appears to Christ as something satanic, right? Separating Christ from the fact that he has to be sacrificed, setting the priesthood and sacrifice apart is seen by Jesus as something satanic. When Satan sits enthroned, according to the book of Revelation, at the end of time, the Lord said he would appear so much like him that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. Right, so it's in the book of Revelation, it's, 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 it's 
speaks about uh, the Antichrist, Satan, sitting enthroned. And it'll be difficult to, to tell the enemy, the Antichrist, and, and Jesus apart. And this is the bit that, I, I really, that really struck with me. But if Satan works miracles, if he lays his hands gently on children, if he appears benign and a lover of the poor, how will we know him from the Christ? Satan will have no scars on his hands or his feet. He may appear as a priest, but never as a victim. He may appear as a priest, but never as a victim. Satan will never sacrifice himself. The triple office entrusted to bishops and priests is to teach, govern, and sanctify the church. Teaching, that's easy. Read a few smart books. Regurgitate it to people. Not hard. Governing, you get to tell people what to do. It's a walk in the park. Sanctifying. You sanctify the church if you're going to sanctify the church. You don't do it just by preaching and teaching. It's important, it's helpful, it's useful. But you sanctify the church. Sanctify, you make it holy by purifying it. Starting with yourself. You sanctify the church with self-sacrifice. You sanctify the church by sacrificing yourself. And that... Satan will never do. So he can accept all the pomp and the glory and the teaching and preaching. He can write loads of theological books even. Satan actually quite knows God quite well. So he could write very good theological books. But he will never sanctify. He will never kneel in adoration. He will never sacrifice himself. He will never be a victim. And this is like key to understanding also the renewal of the priesthood today. We won't renew the priesthood just by being really smart or by understanding the governance structures of the church. Important and all as they are, you won't renew the church like that. You won't renew the priesthood like that. You renew the priesthood when men learn to sacrifice themselves for love of God. And interestingly, isn't that exactly the same thing that we need to do in order to renew fatherhood? In order to renew being a good dad? And isn't that exactly what we learn looking at the cross? We learn what the essence of masculinity is. Jesus, who is true God and true man, the perfect man, who loves even unto death. So when we look at Jesus, we see what priests are called to be and we see what fathers are called to be. And therefore we see the renewal of both. We see how, we see the solution to the crisis, the various crises we find ourselves in at the moment. So to deny or remove from the priesthood sacrifice, to remove the essence of sacrifice from the Mass. And this is quite common too, unfortunately, that when people are asked what the Mass is, well, it's a coming together of the community. Uh, This was a a big issue with the, the Protestant Reformation as well. They took the sacrifice out of the Mass and it became a communion service, became a communion. It's about us in communion with God, yes, but not a sacrifice. And that kind of understanding theology has crept into to our understanding of the Mass too. What's Mass about? The community coming together. We sing a few songs, sign a piece, get your Catholic cookie, and go home. It's not a sacrifice. Like, What does the priest do? Um, he moves stuff from that little table there, that bigger table there, and then he hands it out. <laughs> Sorry, what? Why do you go to Mass every week? What on earth do you go to Mass for to watch a a, a priest move stuff from a small table to a bigger table and then hand it out? Sorry, like, what's actually going on here? These simple elements are being transformed, transubstantiated, changed into Jesus, who is sacrifice, offered to the Father, and given to us that we might be changed into him, remembered, made members of his mystical body. That's what's happening. If we miss that point, what on earth is Mass about? What on earth is the priesthood for? So this, this understanding of, of, of victimhood. Now, just to clarify, victimhood, uh, obviously the word victim is used uh, quite a lot these days. It doesn't mean a person who accepts violence or a person to whom violence has been done. It's a person who's willing to sacrifice themselves. A person who sacrifices themselves. out of love. This is the key to priesthood and to fatherhood.
you get that right, everything else will fall into place. So we ask the good Lord today to renew his priesthood, renew his priests, to renew their understanding of the nobility of their call, not to be famous, not to be well known or applauded, but to be a continuation of Jesus' priesthood, his victimhood, his self-sacrificial nature for love of those entrusted to him. May we as priests never fall short of that mark. May priest mothers pray for and sacrifice for the renewal of the priesthood. And may we see this renewal in our time. Amen.